This is going to be the second punctuation focused video on this channel because the other day I was uh, scrolling somewhere or reading comments or something and someone used an unironic interrobang. I love the interrobang and I love the subject of punctuation. So for anyone who doesn't know, it is kind of exactly what it looks like. It is a combined exclamation mark and question mark. It was created by the head of an advertising agency named Martin K. Spector in 1962. He created it specifically because he didn't like having to <laughs> having to write exclamation and question marks separately and thought it would be more convenient and look better if you had something to combine them. He first debuted it in a magazine called Type Talks and asked readers to submit possible names for it. I love some of them. Uh, they include Exclamaquest and Exclarative, uh, but he settled on Interrobang. The Interrobang actually did have a little bit of support from the 60s onward, but by the end of the decade, it had pretty much phased out of use and no one really adopted it. It was just kind of unnecessary. He basically came up with it for the purpose of efficiency for advertisers uh, and marketing. And there wasn't much of a practical use uh, where you couldn't just write those two punctuation marks separately. That got me into the Wikipedia rabbit hole of failed or unconventional punctuation marks. Also in the 60s, I guess it was an experimental year, for type, there was a French scholar kind of guy named Irv Bazet, I think that's how you're supposed to pronounce his name, who put out this essay called Plumon Lozo. Now, the primary purpose of Plumon Lozo was to introduce a phonemic orthography for French, which basically just means uh, he wanted people to write French in a way that made more sense <laughs> based on how it's spoken. But he also floated the idea of about six new punctuation marks. Some of them are kind of fun, like the love mark, which looks like a heart, or the acclamation mark, which is just meant to be when you're really excited and, and positive when you're saying something. And it looks like a rabbit, which I find cute. The doubt mark is like a squiggly, scratchy question mark. I don't know how useful <laughs> that one would have been. And there's two that I really like, although they have a little bit of overlap. The authority and conviction marks. Authority is meant to be used when you're saying something with authority, and conviction is meant to be used when you're saying something with conviction. I, I, I don't... I guess... <laughs> Authority is when you're acting like you know what you're talking about, and conviction is when you're trying to, when you're lying that you know what you're talking about. I don't know. Those would be so bad. I'm actually really glad that these didn't get picked up, because these would be so bad on, like, could you imagine Reddit with these? It would be a nightmare. Every single sentence would end with one of these. And they would all be wrong. And the final one, which kind of reminds me of, like, a couple of these do, but this one especially reminds me of, like, the, the one symbol from Bloodborne. Uh, the irony mark. And this one I find interesting because it's not the only one of its kind. You'll notice that pretty much every one of these marks is trying to create some sort of symbol to denote the emotion that the speaker is writing with. Uh, but generally, I think that they sort of failed to catch on because they're just kind of unnecessary. Also, perhaps just the obscurity of Buzze's essay. Like, having a love mark is kind of cute, but that can typically be expressed just in the words themselves. I mean, you could even argue that you could just write around, like, an exclamation mark rather than having something specifically to say that you're being, like, forceful when you're saying something. The question mark is probably the most essential one that we use in English in terms of these ending punctuations, just because it's kind of like grammatically necessary to create a sentence. The one that has the most legs here is the irony mark. There is actually a long history of irony or sarcasm punctuation throughout uh, English or just kind of, you know, English lettering languages. If you think about emotions or ways of saying something in English or any language that change the meaning of the sentence in a way that can't be understood really through the text, 
it would be sarcasm. It literally inverts the meaning of whatever you're saying. But English has never had a proper way of actually denoting that. It's all just uh, verbal. Or if you're in writing, you have to go really over the top in the way that you phrase something. Because I'm lazy, according to Wikipedia, you can find suggestions for irony or sarcasm marks as far back as 1668 with John Wilkins' inverted exclamation mark. That, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Might have stepped on Spanish a little bit. The problem with a lot of these suggestions, even though some of them honestly I think look kind of cool as punctuation, is that it's really difficult to introduce new punctuation to people. It's just one of those grammatical things that everyone's sort of grown up with and has been basically standardized for hundreds of years. Generations upon generations have been using essentially the same punctuation marks to denote uh, their feelings and such. So it's hard to introduce something new to people to actually sell them on, uh, because to be honest, most people don't even really care about grammar. It might actually be the most difficult it's ever been now, despite the flow of information, because so much of our communication is done through digital means using stuff like Unicode character sets. If you want to introduce a new punctuation into language, you have to make sure that people can like type it and that fonts have support for it. So what's really interesting is that there actually are modern sarcasm and irony notations that we use pretty often, actually. They're just not characters that we uh, type in the same way we would a question mark. Early versions of this, and this might sound kind of silly, but it is real language, are best seen on Reddit with things like slash s and other tone indicators, as they're called. By the way, I actually learned from this Wikipedia article that the reason you do a slash followed by a letter is that it actually comes from HTML because they have the angled brackets with the slash and something. So eventually they just took the brackets off and then shortened the word to just being the, the first letter. Of, of course on Reddit, only on Reddit. You might not think of that as being like a punctuation, but really it's serving the same kind of purpose. It's there to tell you how you should read the sentence, and it comes at the very end. You could replace the slash s with, you know, one of these sarcasm marks, and it would be the same thing. That sounds like a small kind of example, you know, not everyone uses those. But what if I told you that there's one that almost everyone uses online that is one of these sarcasm marks and actually even goes much further beyond that, and it's emojis. Emojis almost function like an entire library font of just punctuation marks. The way that people use them are really interesting. Like, you will have whole sentences that are split up into smaller chunks that are, are uh, denoted by emojis, where each emoji tells you how you should read the previous like clause or part of the sentence. In the same way that an exclamation point lets someone know who's reading that you're saying something really loudly, there's tons and tons of emojis that are used for similar sorts of emotions. Like, how often have you seen something followed by the skull emoji to, well, you know, it can, it can mean a couple different things, but typically it's shorthand for something like, ah, I'm dead, wow, this is killing me, you know, or I can't believe it, this is crazy, something like that. Personally, I've always read the skull emoji as someone going, <coughs> I'm gonna leave that in. And my favorite one, because it's so funny, but it's absolutely true. It's not an emoji, it's not a tone indicator. It's the SpongeBob meme We're with the chicken. This meme started popping up a couple years ago and people started to use this same sort of capitalization pattern to denote that they were being sarcastic. And what's so crazy about it is that people just intuitively understood that a sentence written like that is sarcasm. Not because they had to be told that this mark means this or infer some kind of slang, you know, decode some slang meaning of what an emoji is, but simply because when you speak sarcastically, uh, you can't... You kind of uh, uh, alternate your voice up and down like this in a, in a very exaggerated way and capitalizing, alternating your capitalization mimics 
the sound, how someone speaks when they're being sarcastic. Nobody could have seen that coming. Like, it's, it's literally, like, just say it out loud like it's written, and you instantly get it. It's kind of this weird reminder because I think we spend so much time learning about culture and history through textbooks and things that are, are kind of firmly set in the past that it's weird to, to remember that every single day how we communicate and what we're doing is not like separate from that. We are actively creating culture and language with all the stuff that we're doing like this. It's commonplace to use emojis in, reg well, not speech, but in regular typing now as a replacement or to make up for the things that you lose when typing. Something else, and, and this isn't even that related, but English has started to pick up uh, little things from uh, that you'll see in other languages that previously didn't exist as a result of internet slang being kind of uh, commonplace now. Have you ever seen, or you've probably done this yourself, someone uh, write something and at the end they say lol or lmao or something something of that like I'm, I'm laughing kind of thing even if what they said wasn't that funny or if you're not actually laughing while you're typing it well what that is is it's not being you know a liar or trying to mislead someone into what you're thinking that you're i don't know more positive than you actually are what it really is the way we really use it is that stuff like that is uh a softener for language. This is something that you see in languages like Japanese, where they will sometimes end sentences in a word like ne, which is doesn't necessarily have a meaning of its own, but it's just used to be more polite. You can ask somebody for something and end it with ne, or suggest something and end it with ne, and it's less Forceful. This is something that has never existed in English, and I think if you were to ask someone 30 or 40 years ago if it was necessary, I don't think most people would even, even think that it would be useful, but it's just naturally gotten into the way that we speak. Sometimes it feels like culture moves like an iceberg, and other times it feels like it moves like a hellcat. <laughs> and having both perspectives uh, is a, a can be kind of disorienting at times, but I hope you found this kind of interesting and a little thought-provoking. I'd love to hear in the comments below if you have any other observations about little language things that have entered your uh, at least written vocabulary, because people tend to, I think, write on the internet in a very different way that they speak. Any funny observations or things that you've noted uh, or things that you think we should do or that you like. At the very least, I hope this was just kind of an interesting look at the way that we communicate with each other, because it kind of forms the foundation of all of society. <laughs>